Hello and welcome to episode 11 of my sports and exercise science series. We're going to be following on from episode 10 by learning more about the cardiovascular system. Last episode, we learned about blood, its purpose, composition and function, and we finished the episode learning about blood pressure. In this episode, we're going to be learning about seven new topics. These include the heart, the chambers and valves of the heart, major blood vessels relating to the heart, the cardiac cycle, cardiac output, arteries, veins and capillaries, and finally we're going to touch on a brief overview of some of the other systems found in the body that we will not be dedicating an entire episode to as the series goes on. To start this video off, let's look at the heart. Your heart is roughly the size of a fist and sits in the middle of your chest, slightly to the left. It's the muscle at the center of your circulation system, pumping blood around your body as the heart beats. This blood sends oxygen and nutrients to all parts of your body and carries away unwanted carbon dioxide and waste products. Your heart pumps blood around the body all the time, about five liters or eight pints of it, and this is called circulation. Your heart, blood, and blood vessels together make up your cardiovascular system or heart and the circulatory system. The right side of the heart receives blood that is low in oxygen because it has mostly been used up by the brain and the body. It pumps this to your lungs where it picks up a fresh supply of oxygen. The blood then returns to the left side of the heart ready to be pumped back out to the brain and the rest of the body. For your heart to pump regularly, it needs electrical signals which are sent to the heart muscle telling it when to contract and when to relax. The electrical signal starts in the right atrium where your heart's natural pacemaker, the sinoatrial node, is situated. This signal crosses the atria, making them contract, and blood is pumped through the valves into the ventricles. Where the atria meets the ventricles, there is an area of special cells called the atrioventricular node, which pass electrical signals throughout your heart muscle by a system of electrical pathways known as the conducting system. The muscles of the ventricles then contract and blood is pumped through the pulmonary and aortic valves into the main arteries. The heart's natural pacemaker, the sinoatrial node, produces another electrical signal and the cycle starts again. So what are the chambers and valves of the heart? The heart has two sides. The right side of the heart accepts used blood that is returning from the tissues of the body and pumps that blood into the lungs where it is replenished with oxygen. The left side of the heart accepts replenished blood from the lungs and pumps that blood out to all the body's organs. Each side of the heart has two chambers, so there is four chambers in total. The two ventricles are muscular chambers capable of propelling the blood out of the heart. The right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs and the left ventricle pumps blood to all other organs. The two atria accept the blood returning to the heart from the body's tissues and from the lungs respectively. At the right moment, the right and left atria empty their accumulated blood into the right and left ventricles. The four heart valves, which are the tricuspid, pulmonary, mitral and aortic valves open and close at just the right moment to keep the blood moving in the proper direction through the heart. It is helpful to visualize the heart functioning as two separate pumps working in series, the right heart pump and the left heart pump. The right heart pump consists of the right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonic valve and the pulmonary artery. Its job is to make sure used blood gets reloaded with oxygen. Oxygen poor blood returning to the heart from the body's tissues enters the right atrium. When the atria contract, the tricuspid valve opens and allows the blood to be pumped from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Then, when the right ventricle contracts, the tricuspid valve closes to prevent blood from washing backwards into the right atrium, and the pulmonic valve opens so the blood is ejected from the right ventricle and out to the pulmonary artery and the lungs, where it is replenished with oxygen. The left heart pump consists of the left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, aortic valve and aorta. Its job is to pump the rich oxygenated blood out to the body's tissues. 
blood returning from the heart and the lungs enters the left atrium. When the atria contract, the mitral valve opens and allows the blood to enter the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts a moment later, the mitral valve closes and the aortic valve opens. Blood is then propelled out of the left ventricle, across the aortic valve and out to the body. Now let's recap on the chambers and valves of the heart. The atria are the collecting chambers where blood waits before entering the ventricles. The ventricles are pumps that then provide the force to propel blood around the body. The right atrium receives deoxygenated blood from the body. The right ventricle pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs. The left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the lungs. And the left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood to the organs of the body. Valves allow blood to flow in one direction and they open and close in response to the pressure of blood flow. The tricuspid valve is positioned between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The bicuspid valve is positioned between the left atrium and the left ventricle. The aortic valve is positioned between the left ventricle and aorta. The pulmonary valve is positioned between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Now that that is covered, what about the major blood vessels leading in and out of the heart? Deoxygenated blood is delivered back to the heart through a series of veins, and these will eventually drain into the two major veins entering the heart. From areas below the heart, blood returns through the inferior vena cava, and from areas above the heart, blood returns to the heart through the superior vena cava. These vena cava pour blood simultaneously into the right atrium, which then contracts to pump blood into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, deoxygenated blood is pumped to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery is the only artery that carries deoxygenated blood. In the lungs, blood becomes oxygenated and returns to the heart via the pulmonary vein. The pulmonary vein is the only vein that carries oxygenated blood. It enters the left atrium before being pumped into the left ventricle where oxygenated blood is pumped into the aorta. The aorta is a large, thick-walled artery that starts the blood on its journey around the body. Let's move on to the cardiac cycle. During the diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle, the atria are contracting to fill the two ventricles with blood and the ventricles are relaxing in between heartbeats. The tricuspid and mitral valves are open during the diastolic phase to allow blood to flow into the ventricles and the pulmonic and aortic valves are closed to prevent blood from washing backwards into the ventricles. During the systolic phase, the two ventricles are contracting to propel blood out to the lungs and out to the rest of the body. The right atrium is filling with used blood from the tissues and the left atrium is filling with oxygenated blood from the lungs. The tricuspid and mitral valves are closed during systole and the pulmonic and aortic valves are open. The concept of the cardiac cycle is useful in several ways. For instance, when we measure blood pressure, we are measuring the pressure in the arteries during both phases of the cardiac cycle, systolic and diastolic. So, blood pressure is reported as two numbers, such as 120 over 80. Here, the systolic blood pressure, which is the arterial pressure at the moment the ventricles are beating, is 120, and the diastolic pressure, which is the pressure during ventricular relaxation, is 80. When cardiologists talk about heart failure, they often specify whether the cardiac dysfunction primarily affects the systolic portion of the cardiac function, as in dilated cardiomyopathy, or the diastolic portion, as in diastolic dysfunction. Proper treatment requires making this distinction. Cardiac output, which is expressed as CO or Q, is the amount of blood pumped out of each ventricle per minute. This is an important measure of an effective functioning heart. The measure of cardiac output is particularly important for athletes as the greater their cardiac output, the greater volume of oxygen available to the working muscles. 
Cardiac output is the product of two other values, heart rate, which is measured in beats per minute, and stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that the ventricle pumps out with each heartbeat and is measured in milliliters. Cardiac output can be measured using a simple formula, which is cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. For example, if we have a heart rate of 72 beats per minute and a stroke volume that is 70 milliliters, cardiac output would be calculated at 5,040 milliliters per minute. This is equivalent to 5 liters, which is close to normal adult blood volume and suggests that the body's total blood supply passes through the heart every minute. During exercise, both heart rate and stroke volume increase significantly. Moving on, let's now look at the details and features of blood vessels, arteries, veins, and capillaries. There are three kinds of blood vessels, arteries, veins, and capillaries. Each one of these plays a very specific role in the circulation process. Arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart, they're tough on the outside but contain a smooth interior layer of epithelial cells that allows blood to flow easily. Arteries also contain a strong muscular middle layer that also helps to pump blood through the body. Capillaries connect the arteries to veins. The arteries deliver oxygen-rich blood to the capillaries where the actual exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs. The capillaries then deliver the waste-rich blood to the veins for transport back to the lungs and heart. Veins carry blood back to the heart. They're similar to arteries, but not as strong or as thick. Unlike arteries, veins contain valves that ensure blood flows in only one direction. Arteries don't require valves because pressure from the heart is so strong that the blood is only able to flow in one direction. Valves also help blood travel back to the heart against the force of gravity. To finish this episode, I want to briefly cover over the other systems of the body. In this series, we've learned about five different systems in detail. However, there are a total of 11 systems. Before we move on to the next section of the series, I thought it would be important to cover and give a super brief overview of the six systems we have not yet covered. First, we have the endocrine system. The glands of the endocrine system secrete chemicals called hormones that regulate most processes in our bodies such as growth, reproduction, metabolism and even control the amount of glucose in our blood. The integumentary system consists of skin, hair and nails. Skin is the largest organ of the body equaling 15-20% to of our total body mass. It acts as a barrier to physical, chemical and biological agents. The skin prevents water loss and regulates body temperature. It transmits the senses of touch, pain and pleasure and maintains body temperature by secreting sweat. The lymphatic system transports clean fluids in our body back to the blood and drains excess fluids and debris from the tissues and cells of our body. It also houses white blood cells known as lymphocytes involved in protecting our bodies from infection. The digestive system begins with our mouths. This system is responsible for the breaking down and absorption of nutrients and the elimination of waste that is not utilized by the body. It is responsible for identifying which minerals, vitamins and other essentials from foods we eat can be absorbed and utilized or stored by the body and which are to be disposed of. The urinary system is responsible for eliminating waste products of metabolism and other materials from the body that are of no use. The system is also responsible for maintaining the balanced fluid volume in our bodies by regulating the amount of water that is excreted, maintaining concentrations of electrolytes and normal pH values of the blood. The reproductive system mainly functions to create human life. Ovaries produce female sex hormones and eggs. Eggs are fertilized in the fallopian tube by sperm and then travel to the uterus which provides a site for growth. The mammary glands produce milk for the newborn. That concludes the 11th episode of my sports and exercise science series. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and don't forget to like and subscribe for more free and educational content. You've been watching UK Fitness Hub. I've been Travis Tarrant and I'll see you in the next episode where we begin study on the principles of training.